Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology, activists uh, for here for Elite Board in Medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. This ecosystem that is being set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network, and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Masco. Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. This month we are going from the macro to the micro. We're going to be talking about how to fix the food system with Dr. Mark Hyman and we're going to be going into the cell danger response with Dr. Bob Navio. We're also going to be hearing later from Dr. Andy Heyman about how to modulate the cell danger response. It's going to be a great episode. Enjoy. So first up, we're going to sit down with Dr. Mark Hyman, whose book last month, The Food Fix, went absolutely ballistic. And I saw so many people online mentioning it, talking about it, big names, really getting behind Mark and his effort to transform the food system. In his book, he really goes after the agricultural industry and the food industry. It's a really, really amazing read. Let's get into the interview. So we are going to start today with Dr. Mark Hyman. And Mark, first of all, congratulations on the new book. I know it's meant a lot to a lot of different people, and it's been amazing to see how far it's traveled. I guess the first question I want to ask is, you know, for the functional medicine practitioner community, why is the food fix really important? Well, functional medicine is all about root causes. And as a practicing functional medicine doctor for 30 years, I've seen patient after patient with chronic disease that's caused by food. <laughs> of course, not all of it's caused by food, but a lot of it is caused by food and can be cured by food. And I began to think, well, I could sit here for the rest of my life seeing patients with chronic illness and not make a dent because people are getting sick from the food they're eating. So I had to ask, why are they eating the food they're eating? It's because of the food system. And then why do we have the food system we have? It's because of our food policies. And why do we have our food policies? It's because of the food industry's influence on policy and government. So the average functional medicine practitioner may not think that their job is political, but our food system is very political. And if food is medicine, we need to think about how we as functional medicine doctors and providers can actually have an impact on the bigger food system that's driving our patient's illness. It's really about root cause analysis. It's about systems thinking. You know, and as I began to look at the whole big picture of the food system, it really became clear to me that the food system is the number one cause of death and disability in the world. Uh, it kills 11 million people a year. Uh, this is according to the Global Burden of Disease Study of 195 countries. And a lot of it was due to processed food and not enough good foods. <clears throat> and that's about a holocaust every year from food. And 250 million years of disability every year in our population. So this is a real problem. Six out of 10 of Americans are of a chronic illness and obesity rates are skyrocketing. We're now at 42%, it used to be 30, then 35, then 37, then 40, 42. It just keeps getting worse. So we have to address this as a systemic issue. And then of course it affects our economy because uh, one in three Medicare dollars is on diabetes, one in three federal budget dollars is on Medicare. Uh, soon it'll be one in two and, and we can't sustain that. Uh, so we have to fix the food system. And then the other issues that are also relevant are social justice issues in terms of poverty, violence, mental health issues, kids' academic performance, national security issues, that we have a military that can't find recruits because they're unfit to fight or, or are, are overweight. Uh, and lastly, environmental climate damage from our food system that's driving the number one cause of climate change, which is our food system. So all these things play a role in, in our entire thinking about how to solve these problems. And if we don't address the food system, we really can't treat our patients. Absolutely. So how is community almost synonymous with food? Well, I believe there's two main drivers of health and well-being. One, food is medicine, and two is community is medicine. Or I was I'll often say love is medicine. And the reason is that, you know, as a functional medicine doctor, I spent a large part of my career focusing on the kind of minutia of our biology, you know, genetics and our microbiome and our immune system and all the nodes of the matrix uh, and looking deep into the biology of what are the ex exposome and what are the lifestyle factors and what are the imbalances in our biological networks and what is our physiology and all that stuff. So that was 
really good and it helped me to really understand biology. But then I realized that most of the things that were driving disease were things that had to do with people's social structures and they're so, what they call the social determinants of health and, and our um, entire context in which we live. And if we don't address that, if we don't address the loneliness, isolation, disconnection, if we don't address the fact that people change their behavior better when they're supported and accountable in groups, then we won't be able to help our patients because a lot of the things that we are asking them to do is not take a pill, but to change their diet, to fix their sleep, to exercise, to meditate, to do basic things that have to be uh, easy for them in the context of their lives. And it's often not easy because they live in social structures that don't support well-being and health. So uh, that's really what led me to create the Daniel Plan with Rick Warren, which was a faith-based wellness program. We got uh, 15,000 people in groups, small groups, to work together to get healthier and to live better lives. And in the year, they lost a quarter million pounds. They got off medications, stopped going in and out of the hospital. I had really for depression, autoimmune disease, obesity, diabetes, you name it. <clears throat> autoimmune diseases were amazing how they responded to changes in diet and support. So we know that, that this vehicle of connection, community, is really the big driver of behavior change, which is absolutely a must in terms of dealing with that burden of chronic disease. So that's really why I think community is so powerful. Love is medicine. I say getting healthy is a team sport, that friend power is more powerful than willpower. And we're seeing this at Cleveland Clinic in our Functioning for Life groups which are basically a group model of behavior change with the intel inside of functional medicine about how to change biology. And uh, we're now you know, among the top, I think if not the top uh, group visit providers uh, within the entire organization, which is amazing. And also uh, we're seeing incredible changes in our shared medical appointments, which we've built to actually work within the system, but ideally you wouldn't even need to have a full shared medical appointment. You could have a health coach, a nutritionist uh, and other providers that are, uh, you know, uh, ancillary providers providing the instruction and care and have just as good effect. So I think the future of healthcare is a combination of the intel inside of functional medicine combined with the science of behavior change using the power of groups and peer support actually make a difference. So that's why I think community is so important. All of your last books have been on the topic of food. Why do you think our society is so obsessed with food? Why is our culture obsessed with food? Because we like to eat uh, and uh, our entire existence depends on us eating. Our culture is focused on eating. Our families are often built around eating. So we're very obsessed with, with eating. But recently there's been an increased surge of interest in, in healthy eating, whether it's ketogenic diets or vegan diets or paleo diets. Uh, and there's a you know, huge interest in the power of food as medicine now, which wasn't there before. And I think that's very exciting to me. You've got big companies talking about it. You've got the government talking about it. You've got healthcare systems like Cleveland Clinic creating a food as medicine program. So we're really in a, in a unique situation where we're, we're breaking through to understand that you know, food is such a powerful vehicle for health and well-being. And so I think that's part of why our culture is so obsessed with food. On the downside, there's an you know, enormous food industry pushing tremendous amounts of misinformation and uh, marketing and uh, very bad foods that are driving so much of chronic disease. And, and I think people are becoming more aware of that. Even these big companies are becoming aware of it. So you know, processed ingredients, people don't want those anymore. And then the Burger King had an ad where they showed a a big Whopper molding over 34 days to the tune What a Difference a Day Makes. And they showed literally going from you know, a nice looking Whopper to completely moldy, disgusting, rotten food. And the tagline was no artificial preservatives as a leading edge marketing strategy to teach people that maybe their products aren't so bad and they're healthy. Well, they're not healthy, but it's a good thing. On Kellogg's announced they're getting glyphosate out of their cereal and General Mills and Danone have committed a million acres to regenerative ag which is really, really exciting because that means that they're responding to the marketplace, to consumers, and I think they're understanding we need to change what we're doing. So we have to fix our food system, and that is really how you know, we're gonna get our, out of this disease epidemic mess, the chronic disease that's killing so many people around the world, 70% of deaths worldwide. So uh, we are obsessed with food, but if we focus on food in the right way, I think it's a good thing. Obviously, we've seen a lot of diet crazes over the last two decades and more. You know, why, how does this affect the health of the population? Well, I mean, 
The truth is that there are all these diet wars, paleo, vegan, keto, low fat, low carb, high carb, low carb. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy and it makes people crazy. But the truth is that all those health focused ways of eating have far more in common with each other than they do with a typical American diet. In fact, my book Food Fix is number one in both paleo and vegan, which I uh, take as a uh, very good sign that we're breaking down these diet wars, we're breaking down these dichotomies and people really want to understand how to eat well for them and for the planet. And, and um, I think we need to move away from this oppositional approach. I think we need to sort of understand what are the common principles of nutrition. I jokingly call it the pegan diet. Uh, I've also been talking lately about the regenitarian diet, which is a way of eating that helps regenerate the earth and your health and the well-being of animals. And it's a, a very different way of framing food as opposed to meat or no meat. It's about how it's grown and where it's grown and with what it's grown. And, and how and the animals are cared for or not. And that is really an important concept. So I, I encourage you to check out regenerative agriculture and the concept of regenitarian, which I sort of made up. <laughs> and, and then the vegan diet is really just looking at what are the common principles of what we all agree on. You know, I, I often joke, I was at a sort of a conference when I was on a stage with a paleo doc and a vegan doc and they were fighting and I was in the middle and I was like, well, if you're paleo and you're vegan, I must be pegan. And I was joking and I thought about it and I was like, wait a minute, there's more in common that they have with each other than traditional... Uh, American diets. They both agree that we should be eating a lot of plant-rich foods, that we should have nuts and seeds, that we should have good fats, that we should eat tons of veggies and fruit, um, that we should avoid dairy. I mean, whether that's controversial, but should we avoid dairy? And then, and then there's the, you know, things that are different, which is basically where you get your protein, from beans and grains or from animal protein. That's the only difference. Uh, and I think if, if you look at that, it's, it's kind of uh, it's kind of a false dichotomy. I think grains and beans, when prepared properly in their whole form, are healthful food. I think uh, the evidence is certainly not definitive that meat is bad. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that it's very good for you in terms of its nutrient density, protein quality, uh, the nutrient content, and, and much more. And if it's grown in a way that's regenerative or sustainable or pasture-raised, you know, and the animals are cared for, it actually can be a better strategy for regenerating the planet than just plants. And people don't understand this, but um, and I was sort of shocked to learn when I was researching my book, Food Fix, that uh, just in the process of plant agriculture, so if you're a vegan, you're just plant-based, the act of agriculture is so destructive to ecosystems that it destroys the habitat of so many animals, and in the process of harvesting and growing the food, many animals are killed. Uh, in fact, seven billion animals are killed growing plants every year uh, in America, and uh, that's pretty striking compared to 29 million cows, which is a lot, but it's far less than the seven billion. So is a rabbit's worth life worth less than a cow? I, I don't know. I mean, you have to decide on that yourself, but I think we just should be real about what we're doing in terms of agriculture in general. And I think then we, we need to look at what kind of ways we grow the plants. If you do industrial organic or conventional farming, you might be destroying the soil, using lots of water and resources and actually contributing to climate change. Whereas if you have regenerative beef, compared to an, you know, a GMO soy burger, which is very popular now, you actually are uh, adding carbon back into the environment, into the soil, as opposed to with the GMO burger, adding carbon to the atmosphere, which is causing more climate change. So it's not such a false economy as, economy as meat, no meat. It's not the cow, as Russ Conzer said, it's the how. So I really encourage uh, people to not get into these diet wars, to look at what works for them, what they feel good on, check your blood test, make sure you're not deficient in anything, if you're uh, vegan especially, and, and see um, you know, what works for you, but try to be aspirational around a regenerative diet, around the vegan principles. Uh, my, my, I have another book, believe it or not, coming out in December called The Pegan Diet. So I, I feel um, like this is my attempt to try to break through all the controversies, all the diet wars and the craziness. Doc, what are your recommendations for people who are alone and uh, on the road all the time to stay healthy and eat well? Well, um, you know, a lot of times I'm on the road, probably half the time. I'm trying to change that, but I'm on the road probably half the time. And I, I always bring a day's worth of food with me in my backpack. And I get it from Thrive Market, which is 25 to 50% off um, the retail price. And it's all delicious foods that is shelf stable, things like turkey jerky or bison bars or nut butters or, you know, there's all sorts of great snacks on there and I, I keep enough food for at least a day in my bag so I never get stuck anywhere. And, uh, and I'm an investor in Thrive Market to be transparent. It's, it's a great company that is providing really good food uh, at a dramatically discounted price uh, from what you can, for example, at Whole Foods. And then um, I often be, I'm very diligent about picking the restaurants where I go. 
So I don't let people choose like, so let's go to Denny's. I'm like, nah, you know? So I, I'm very careful about trying to hunt and gather for the right healthier options in restaurants. And I can look at the menus online now. So I can kind of be a little bit of a restaurant whisperer. And I encourage you to figure out how to hunt and gather wherever you're going. And I do the same thing with, the, with my health and fitness. You know, I'm, I'm always tracking where's a yoga class or where can I go work out or where, what can I do that, you know, keeps me healthy on the road because it's really, really important. <laughs> and I think, I think it's a, a myth that you can't do it because, you know, like I said, I'm on the road most of the time. I eat really well. I don't, you know, get into trouble. You know, sometimes I'll go off the rails a little bit, but if you're a little smart about it, uh, it's possible. And even in airports now, there's healthier food and healthier options, and uh, you can get actual real food, which is striking to me. So the, the things are changing. So final question, how can our practitioner community really get involved in fixing the food system? Well, I think all of us have to be part of the change for the food system, whether it's changing what you're doing in your own life. And on my website, foodfixbook.com, there's an action guide, Food Fix Action Guide, which is free. Uh, and it has over 20 different suggestions for what we can do as individuals. As healthcare providers, I think we should be innovating around food as medicine in our practices with groups, shared medical appointments, uh, and, and pushing pushing forward to try to actually incorporate this in our own systems, but we're gonna to have to shift reimbursement. We're gonna to have to go towards value-based care. That's actually happening. So I think, you know, as a matter of time, food as medicine will be reimbursed, medical prescriptions for food will be, will be reimbursed, and people can have access to a different kind of care that we provide, uh, which we're uniquely suited to provide. So uh, whether you wanna just do it in your own clinic, whether you wanna be a voice for change in your local state or on the federal level, whether you want to get involved in your community with you know, various kinds of initiatives around food as medicine, food prescriptions, um, even things like composting, community gardens, all these things can be really awesome. So I, I think food, uh, food is medicine for sure, but practitioners need to also understand that their, their clinic doesn't end at the walls of their clinic. It actually needs to encompass the greater community in which they live and understand that, that the food system needs to be addressed and they can plug in wherever they feel uh, inspired to do so. Doc, thanks so much for taking the time to be here on the Functional Forum. Let's crack on with the next segment. All right, so now that we've looked at the macro, now we're going to go into the micro and we're going to go inside the cell to talk about the cell danger response with researcher Dr. Bob Navio. This new phenomenon that Dr. Navio has uncovered really backs up the functional medicine operating system for chronic inflammatory diseases. It was one of the most interesting lectures that I saw in the whole of last year, and here are some of the best bits for you today. So I'll give two talks today, one before the break and one after. The first one, we'll try to weave together a lot of threads, okay? And, and you know, many of you know that scientists are swimming in data from experiments, um, and in order to communicate the large-scale results, you actually have to tell the story in reverse, <laughs> okay? So it's through our discoveries of the chemistry used to regulate the different stages of healing, that we are able to come to this more holistic understanding of, of, of those stages and how they're dynamically regulated. But first, I've been studying for the last 30 years um, about 30 different diseases that have all increased between two and 50 times over the last 20 years. So, you know, so many of these are ones that you all know about autism, post-traumatic stress disorder, post-treatment Lyme, chronic fatigue syndrome, but environmental childhood cancers have also increased. Okay, and um, so the question is, our genes don't change that fast in 30 years, so what's happening in our environment and what is it that is causing us to react to that and to the environment in ways that lead to disease. Okay, so um, I'll go back to the, uh, a, a line from um, a poem of John Dryden's in 1681 um, that self-defense is nature's oldest law. So everyone in this room is descended from ancestors who had every gene they needed in order to survive every famine, every cold winter, every plague before they had at least their first child. Okay? So we've, we've inherited that legacy, okay? that genome, that, that pool of genes. But the world is changing. 
And so those genes are now interacting with new environmental factors. And, and I call that an ecogenetic mismatch. Okay? Um, and I see an ecogenetic mismatch as fundamentally the basis of all chronic illness. So this is a map that happens to be of mitochondrial DNA, um, uh, you know, um, movements, migrations o over history. In the last 300 years, we've had movement um, uh, from North, uh, North Euro Northern Europe and Africa to the United States, which changed the microbiome that people were exposed to. Um, and also our culture is changing rapidly, and so the, this M haplogroup that happens to be present in, um, uh, as a dominant haplogroup in, do I have a, oh yeah, um, haplogroup in India. Um, the, there's been a rapid westernization of, uh, of, uh, of Indian culture that is leading to this explosion of Western diseases like diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular disease. Okay. And so ecogenetic mismatches lead to chronic illness. So in the beginning, life evolved in the sea, and it, we used small molecules um, uh, in, in order to conduct the business of life. Um, and, but what's happened in, in the world since those beginnings is that just the activity of, of, you know, of humanity has ecological impacts on, on parts of the world that we don't often pay attention to, but there is, many of you know, there's a, um, a North Pacific garbage patch that is now twice the size of Texas. Um, and it's made up of, 90% of it is made up of plastics and microplastics. Um, I was on a, uh, a, um, an expedition, a cruise um, off the coast of California called the uh, Cal Echoes Cruise. There's a recent science paper that actually used some of the um, box core, ocean core sediments in order to show this exponential rise of plastics that have occurred since World War II in the, the, the layers of sediment um, deposited since, since 1945. Um, that just came out last week, let's see. So, but the chemistry of the sea today includes a lot of these other molecules that are familiar to people. Um, so dioxins, bisphenol A, Roundup, <laughs> benzidine, paraquat, number of pharmaceuticals. Okay, so our, our world is experiencing a, an invisible rising tide that for the most part we're really not measuring. But this rising tide gets into our food chain and to our water and our air and influences gene expression and influences metabolism. So this is a, a plot of the rising prevalence of, of autism that has occurred over the last 30 years. Um, but it's not just autism. You know, so this is a, um, a, a plot of type 1 diabetes. And since 1990, there's been also an ex, you know, exponential rise in type 1 diabetes. So that's a, you know, a, an autoimmune disease uh, destroying the um, islet cells of the pancreas. So how can you start putting together you know, an autoimmune disease on the one hand, autism, which is thought to be principally a neurodevelopmental disorder of synapse function um, with uh, all those other diseases that are also, again, diseases you can think of as bubbling up through a sea of probability of our own making, <laughs> okay? So, so when you start seeing an increase in chronic fatigue syndrome that's been about 50 fold since 1985, okay? Um, or autism uh, or, um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease or something simple like um, uh, peanut allergies, okay? What brings all these things together? They're happening together. It's a set. These are not independent things, okay? These are all things that are bubbling up through a probability matrix that we are creating um, in, in, in kind of humaniforming our environment, not terraforming, but humaniforming our environment. 
All right, so 1988 was a tipping point for sustainability. It turned out that we, there was about 5.1 billion people in, um, uh, on the planet at that time. And at that, that was the moment at which the, the collective of, of human consumption utilized resources that the Earth could replace within one year and excreted waste products at a rate at which those waste products could be recycled. But ever since that threshold of 5.1 billion people, we've been withdrawing from the biological capital of the planet. So today, um, the global average uh, is that we consume, so now we have 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet, and, and collectively we consume about 1.75 Earth resources, you know, planetary resources per year. And, uh, it, but U.S. consumes about five times the one, you know, five Earths a year per, per capita versus India at 0.7. All right, so let's start putting that, those kind of global facts into medical um, perspective. So the first thing you need to know about metabolism is that the brain controls metabolism. I'll, I'll say that. Okay. So, so, um, and, and this has been a real re revelation that every disease that psychiatrists have said have just been a brain disease, we find to be a whole body disease when you look at the chemistry. Okay. So, the brain interacts with a variety of different sensory systems. So, you know, our, our five canonical sen um, uh, symptom or senses uh, of, you know, of sight and sound and, and uh, taste and, and smell and, and touch. Um, but also all of our different organs interact in different ways with, um, the, with the environment. And the collective action of, of those sensory inputs and, and um, our, our, which includes what we eat and how we act and what we smoke um, and the water we, the water we, we drink ends up creating a, a metabolic network. That produces a chemical signal that is under continuous subconscious monitoring by what are called circumventricular organs. So there are eight cir circumventricular organs um, in the brain stem and, and uh, midbrain that uh, many of you will know about the area of prostrema um, in the medulla that is the, um, a, a chemosensory zone for, um, let's say, uh, the, a vomiting response to um, in, ingesting a toxin. Okay, or a chemotherapy during cancer. Um, but anyway, these, these zones are in the brain, in the central nervous system, but do not have a blood-brain barrier. Okay? So they are continuously monitoring the chemistry, okay? not just the osmolality of the blood, not just the oxygen content of the blood, but also the metabokine signals in the blood. So metabokines are metabolites, that have signaling function outside the cell and actually bind to receptors. All right. And adjustments are made in gene expression uh, according to the metabolic uh, networks that occur in this dynamic interaction with the environment. Mitochondria are like a well, canary in the coal mine. You probably heard that many many times. But you know their 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 job is to constantly sense life through the flow of electrons. Okay. So if something comes into the cell and begins to steal resources, that's perceived as a, as a voltage drop across mitochondria. Okay. Electron flow to mitochondria decreases. And that can be a virus, a pathogen, it can be a polycyclic aromatic compound, um, you know, uh, it can be any number of different things. But then when mitochondria see that, 
um, they instantly, I mean, this is within seconds, change structure and function. So I'll go through a lot of these other things, but you know, roughly uh, mitochondria are, uh, contain um, proteins that catalyze over 500 different chemical reactions. And that when exposed to those danger signals of a, de a voltage drop, a decreased electrons, um, uh, they will initiate a, a phased series of responses, okay, a proportional responses. It doesn't, mitochondria does, don't have on off, they have many grades of change of function, okay. And because every cell has, you know, between 100 and 3,000 mitochondria, mitochondria within a cell um, create a kind of a metabolic vote, okay, about the, the overall health status of the cell. Okay, so the hub of the wheel, um, pure energy, I, I, since I haven't introduced that, con that word yet, but um, ATP and uh, so, so, so adenosine triphosphate, guanosine, and inosine are the three principal um, purines. Um, but the outside voice of the cell uh, in terms of, of uh, purine signaling ends up being adenine containing uh, purines. Okay. Um, the inside voice turns out to be guanosine containing purines, okay? But the outside voice through, um, signaling to, to G protein coupled receptors and ionotropic receptors um, are ATP. And also, this purinergic signaling um, uh, embraces uh, specific pyrimidines, including uh, uridine and uridine diphosphate, so, which also bind to these receptors. But I'll talk about uh, these nucleotides as one class of metabokines. Okay. Metabokines just being metabolites that have one function inside the cell, but a completely different function. Well, an informational function outside the cell. So Dr. Heyman talked about you know, the kind of classical mitochondrial functions and how that's evolved over time. And I, I, I think I put this, oh yeah, so, so that was a little, so I'll do that again. Watch, okay. So, um, so there's a honeybee that goes into a, an Erlenmeyer flask here. Um, and uh, we've, mitochondriacs um, have studied mitochondrial function in isolation um, since the 1950s, since the first tools for mitochondrial isolation um, from the cell came, uh, were, were, were developed. And so that was, uh, an important first step because it allowed us to purify the organelle from other subcellular organelles like lysosomes and peroxisomes in the nuclei. Um, but it also allowed us to then further purify the electron, the complexes of the electron transport chain, which were all found to be nanomolecular machines. They're multi subunit complexes that all work together. So again, Cooperativity is a theme that keeps coming back, and you know. So the more cooperativity a cell has, the more function it has. Okay. The less cooperativity, the less function it has. The more. So. Yeah. So, well, maybe this is the time to briefly talk about something we learned in economics from Adam Smith. So, um, Adam Smith came up with a, a phrase: "It does not pay for generalist to cooperate." So that might take a little, so you can flip that. You could say dramatically improved industrial output is achieved by cooperation of specialists. So on an assembly line for, you know, let's say making a Model A Ford, you know, you have a specialist that makes the frame, another specialist that puts together a carburetor, another specialist that puts together electrical system. Cells achieve optimum function through diversity, through combining these specialist functions. Okay. All right, and so 
why do I use a honeybee? Because if you only studied a honeybee, you could, you could dissect it. You could, you know, um, in a living honeybee, you could actually do, um, uh, you know, uh, electromyography and study the electrophysiology of flight muscles. And you could f study respiration. But you would not have a clue of the, the pivotal importance that the honeybee plays in an ecosystem in the outside world. <laughs> Okay. You need to study it in its actual context. And what we've been doing for 50 years is studying mitochondria cracked open from the cell and studied in a little tube. Okay. And it, the, the, these new insights that really have only come over the last 10 years have come because we're starting to put mitochondria back into the cell. So mitochondrial DNA copy number sets the metabolic capacity. So the, the most, you know, um, the, the cell that actually has the, the most ultimate metabolic capacity um, that is mostly resting, okay, is the primary oocyte that has over a million uh, mitochondrial DNAs per cell. Uh, cardiac muscle can be over, over 6,000, as can um, uh, hippocampal neurons. And fibroblasts are down at around 116. But why do I say this? It's because... The more mitochondrial DNA per cell you have, the less capable that cell is of dividing. Okay? That's a really key concept. Okay? So more mitochondrial DNA makes you more functional. Okay? It gives you more capacity. But it also has it's, well, a tumor suppressor function. Okay, it, it, you, know, you could think of it that way. Um, that it, it decreases the ability of the cell to divide. So, um, and then cells with low mitochondrial DNAs uh, per cell have a much greater capacity to be induced into proliferation. Okay? Um, and there's also an increased risk of apoptosis when you combine high mitochondrial D DNA with high resting metabolic activity with stress, okay? So you have those three things together and you can create glutamate excitotoxicity and cell death. Um, you can, well, I won't go into it anymore, but. So, so when you look at, so you know, we put together a lot of, of um, different diseases that we kept on encountering in the course of our care of children with primary, and adults with primary mitochondrial disease and they came from, um, you know, different, Places all around the, the all in all subspecialties of medicine, including autism. But interestingly, they're the same as you know. These disorders include the same disorders that we are finding have been increasing over the last thirty years. That was some pretty heavy science. So to unpack it and talk about how we can use this information in clinical practice, we have none other than Dr. Andy Heyman, who is one of the best known educators, researchers, and clinicians in the space. And he shared at the same conference how to contextualize this information into clinical practice. Enjoy. So my job is to take um, some of this difficult science and put it into a clinical framework and try and draw some inspiration from a variety of the comments that you've heard earlier and translate that into a process of care, um, one that I can say, at least in our world, as a model of dysregulated mitochondrial metabolism, uh, we have some reliability on what I'm, what I'm going to present to you. We've published two randomized controlled trials. We uh, now have some very nice outcomes data tying uh, genomic response to our therapeutic approach. And while on the one hand, 
this is a framework that I apply to my biotoxin patient, I think it encapsulates in some ways a lot of what we already do. It will hopefully give you some additional tools that you might not think of and show you sort of where our typical limits exist and a few tricks on how to get over those last humps. Not easy. N not an easy topic. Not easy patience. A lot of thought has gone into why do we do what we do? And just as importantly, uh, there's an order. There's an order. And hopefully, as I explain why I do what I do, the order will start making some, some sense. So let's talk about how do we unravel this mystery and create a roadmap. Some of you have heard this term, not all of you. Uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. The new thinking, the new thinking for us, the new thinking for you, if you are familiar with this topic, is that ultimately this is a mitochondrial-based disease. And I want you to leverage off that point to start thinking a little differently about these patients. By definition, this is an entity of chronic inflammation. And by virtue of that, there is a tremendous amount of cellular dysregulation. And what I mean is a fair amount of metabolic disorder that arises as a result of this inflammatory process. And that will become more and more obvious as I take you on this journey. This notion that patients can get stuck in these sort of permanent states of dis-ease is really critical to understanding a core feature of the illness. And I mentioned it before, this notion that once patients migrate into this pro-inflammatory state, they have a very hard time getting out of it. In Dr. Navio's nomenclature, they're stuck in the CDR1 category. They are not able to migrate to two or three. And by definition, this is the most pro-inflammatory, the most pro-oxidative, the most cellular derangement. It is the alarm phase of the cell. It is the alarm phase of the mitochondria. And as this unravels through the patient's physiology, it is an absolute disaster. And it's a disaster because ultimately over time, I think some of us have forgotten that all of these metabolic and functional shifts that we talk about in our practice in some of our patients still leads to organ-based disease and tissue disruption and, and uh, damage. So make no mistake, when people end up in this spot and they're getting sicker and sicker and sicker and they're unable to shift, they're injuring key tissues and organs in the body and some beyond repair. So it is also expressly an illness of the innate immune system this upregulation 
of the early immune response, which was supposed to be designed to shift to adaptive immunity by virtue of the transition utilizing antigen presenting cells that turn on T cells and B cells that not only are more specific but help resolve the uh, inflammatory process. That doesn't happen in these patients. And I'll talk about why as well. And unfortunately, it's a syndrome that these metabolic shifts are happening throughout all tissues, all cells, all organs simultaneously. And therefore, it's syndromic. The puzzle clinically then is when you see these patients, because they present with so many different complaints, so many different symptoms, sometimes even though you see 10 patients in a row that all fall in this category, they all appear to be a little different, and they're not. It's just that there's so much disorder that they can have a variety of symptoms and a variety of complaints and a variety of findings, and it gets to be really confusing. So how do we wrap our arms around this entity? We have to accept the fact that it's multi-system, multi-symptom, and it's syndromic. The good news is, and, and I look at this model and I think, okay, here are all the changes that occur in that mitochondria, and what are the ones that we might be able to target clinically? What are some things that we do that, in another lens, build metabolic resiliency? or metabolic flexibility? How can we begin to counteract and usher the mitochondria through its normal stages towards healing? How can we help the cell break free, essentially? What are all of the big inputs and little inputs and very specialized inputs to try and create change? And there's so much that we don't know about that process, but there are some things that we, we do know. And while our group hasn't measured the metabolomics of mitochondrial response and activity, I should say, but we do measure the transcriptomics. And we can see, and we've shown, and some of this is hot off the press, that the lifestyle changes, exercise, sleep, nutrient-dense diet, strategic replacement of nutrients, use of botanicals and hormones can get you actually pretty far down the path, almost all the way. What we found in our work is that it doesn't get you to the final end zone, which is restoration of normal mitochondrial function, re, full re-regulation of genomic activity until we add a few extra things. So I hold this in my head and I think, huh, we're getting changes in mitochondrial structure, we're sealing up the borders and boundaries, as Dr. Navio said, why do we change lipid structure? We want to keep in intracellular pathogens to, to disallow them from escaping. And the cell stops communicating with its neighbors. It walls itself off. We begin to see a pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative stress state. Why? We're not burning oxygen anymore. We're allowing that to accumulate inside the cell for defense. And we see a shift towards that pro-inflammatory state. All adaptive, as, as uh, Tom said, whether we're under stress or cells under stress, it should be a temporary event. But what happens when we lose resiliency and we begin to see 
pathologic changes in the cell response that appear to become permanent, where we're not, the cell or, or we as an organism are not really responding appropriately to our environment. And one way to reframe something you already know is if chronobiology matters, if gene environment interactions matter, that change is the healthiest expression, what happens when cells or systems stop changing and they end up resting in a permanent state of affairs? One measurement that you have, which is incredibly powerful in that regard, is cortisol. When cortisol levels go flat and you lose the diurnal pattern, it means that the entire stress system has gone quiescent and it's trying to prevent further self-harm by ongoing stress. That's why the body does this. Now, ultimately, cortisol as a catabolic hormone can be incredibly destructive. And where are the most cortisol receptors in the brain concentrated? The hippocampus. Why did Dr. Dr. Navio talk about how important the integrated stress response is and why we have to consolidate memories? Because the hippocampus is the crossroads of the stress response and the context of memory. So when you're under stress and the hippocampus lights up, you start consolidating memories and attaching emotion and import to those memories. But guess what happens over time? If you have too much stress, we see excess glutamate, we see microglial activation, and ultimately over time, the hippocampus starts to change its shape and atrophy. And we get dendritic retraction, so it ends up being too small. And when that happens, cortisol levels go flat because the brain has finally said enough is enough. But the problem is, is that you're, learning, you're losing diurnal patterning. So whether you get stuck at the cellular level in a state of ongoing stress or at a systems level in a state of ongoing stress, it's always bad for the body. And how do we dig our patients out of that? Sleep, fasting, laughter, meaning and purpose, healthy diet, all the big inputs. And then we can start modifying the stuff underneath because we want to usher patients through that process. And I think it's a brilliant question to ask, what's healing? What are the biological components of healing? Is it the reverse of the pathway towards illness or is it something else altogether? And I think integrative medicine and functional have always had some answers in that regard. And if you picked up on some clues from what Tom said, the big levers matter. The stuff you talk about matters. Stress management, rest and restoration and repair, giving cells a break by fasting, interesting. All the literature that's coming out on mTOR and AMPK and why that helps the cell take a break and maybe get move through some of these pathways. So that all might sound, well, I already do all that. But we're beginning to understand some of the mechanisms why all of that is so important. And, and I'm a big believer, too, in what was mentioned earlier, and I think it was Dr. Navio who said, you know, if carnitine is low, you don't just replace it. You know, that, that doesn't mean that as a countermeasure that's going to get you back to health. And I think we have an incredible Achilles heel and vulnerability in our field in particular because we are information junkies. We love measuring stuff, right? We go to these fancy labs and we can measure amino acids and fatty acids and hormones and toxins and, you know, all sorts of things now. 
But just because something is low doesn't mean it's bad. Some, just because something is high doesn't mean it's bad. It's the pattern that matters. And so we have to be really careful about what are our countermeasures? What are the findings that we think might be clinically meaningful as opposed to just an epiphenomenon of the underlying disorder? And so we thought quite a bit about this in our treatment approach. And while it may only hold true for the innate immune category, that's a big category. And I feel like if we don't shine a light on it, you're missing a lot of your patients and you're missing opportunities for healing. So how big is it? We think it's about 22% of the population that carry alleles on that HLA that confer poor antigen presentation. And what's interesting in the literature is that this number, 22% or 20%, comes up over and over and over in a lot of disease categories. For example, what percent of patients who are treated for known Lyme disease don't ever fully recover and eliminate their symptoms? 20%. And we see this all the time. I mean, I could go through a lot of different illnesses, but, but this number seems to be persistent. And I think there is this vulnerability. Now, the question, and I think this is maybe the question, just because you have an inherited vulnerability, that doesn't mean the minute you're born, you're expressing this problem. The question is, what were the other allostatic loads that ultimately led to this chronic inflammatory state, that the body finally made the shift? And is it genetic? Is it epigenetic? Is it transgenerational epigenetic? Was it a toxin? Was it the last infection? Was it the last bite of the donut? Was it the emotional trauma? What made that shift? What expressed that vulnerability? where the cells finally said, okay, I'm going into combat mode, and I'm staying here. We know that in this category of biotoxin, it's a big category. And when I use the term biotoxin, I basically just mean organisms or pieces of organisms parts of cell wall membranes, endotoxins, lipopolysaccharides, mycotoxins, mycolactones. There is a long list of this stuff that's out there that we are exposed to that can trigger very efficiently this innate immune response. And when you take that vulnerable person where they've somehow magically walked up to that edge And it's that last exposure to mold. It's the last exposure to an infection. It's the last exposure to algae or some other organism that pushed them over the edge. And you go through this metabolic transition into this pro-inflammatory state. I don't know the answer to that question. I know groups are asking that question. I think it's a really important question to ask. And we do our best clinically in our history and physical, but everybody has a cut point. Everybody has this moment where their resiliency is finally broken down. And the systems, the brain, the cells all say enough is enough. 
I'm going from my normal oxidative phosphorylation into my hypometabolic hyperinflammatory overdrive. And we're going to burn everything down until we figure this out. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Functional Forum. Really enjoyed making this episode. I hope you enjoyed it too. So much to take away on what you can do locally in your practice to affect the food system and also what you can do by understanding the cell danger response that makes functional medicine a critical part of the future of chronic disease care. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll see you next time.